welcome to everyone, and if you're a guest with us today, we welcome you. We are so happy to have you in service with us today. Amen. And to those of you that are joining us online, we welcome you as a part of this service. And um, those of you that are a part of this congregation, unable to be here for whatever reasons, we, we, we welcome you. I mentioned, I'll just mention this quickly, I mentioned Thursday evening a uh, sort of an unfolding thing. I don't know how unfolding it all will be, but I made a connection with, with a pastor from Kenya through Facebook. And um, yesterday, well, Friday morning, or excuse me, afternoon with the time, recent time change, um, and, so, and yesterday morning I spoke by Facebook Messenger. Um, Friday, they uh, had the video on on the phone so I could see who I was speaking to. Yesterday, there was no video, so I don't know if I was speaking to five people or 500 people, uh, but it was a unique experience. So it's amazing. You know, there's a lot of the, 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 the devil likes to take things God means for good and twist them around for evil. And uh, I don't think the internet and technology is evil, but the enemy has used it for a lot of bad. But I'm excited that the church is using it for some good things. Amen. Praise God. So... Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 8. I promise to do my best to not make up for the last five weeks of no preaching all this morning. Amen. Hebrews 11, verse number 8. Brother Herring will be with us again next weekend. And again, ever how long the Lord leads for that, that'll, that'll be the case. So, Hebrews 11, verse number 8. By faith... When he was called to go out, by faith Abraham, excuse me, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. If you're going to go where God wants you to go, you're going to have to be prepared to go without knowing all the details but trusting that he has a plan, and it's a really good plan. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. I want to ask you a question this morning for my title, and that is Who built your foundation? Who built your foundation? Father, thank you for your awesome presence that we have experienced here in this place today. And God, I know that we haven't just simply felt your presence, but you have worked and moved in this place in a powerful way. God, I believe there are things that you've done that only time will fully reveal that have happened in these last few moments. And I thank you for that. And now, God, I trust and pray that through your word you would continue to speak and minister to us. I pray, God, that this wouldn't be just a sermon for this service, but you would let me be a messenger for you. To say what you would want to say to those that have needs in their lives to hear from you today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust you. I depend upon you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It is, for most of us as occupants, something we rarely think about, but one of the most important parts of a structure, and that is the foundation. 
you don't decorate the foundation. You don't, uh, you know, you don't paint it. You don't, in fact, it gets hidden. However, without a proper foundation, a structure is not going to last. And our lives are the same thing. We've got to be built on the proper foundation. The scripture says that Abraham was looking for a city which had foundations that God was the builder of that foundation because I think Abraham understood that the surest foundation that there is is the foundation that God built. Or it is a foundation that is built upon God. But I think some of the significance of this verse in Hebrews is found through the story of Abraham in the book of Genesis. The Bible tells us that Abraham, God, for whatever reasons, God selected Abraham as to be the one that he began to work through to bring about some amazing things naturally and spiritually. And part of what he does is he tells Abraham that you've, you've got to leave your surroundings. You've got to leave what you're used to. Can I, can I tell you that when God calls you into salvation, you're going to have to leave some stuff behind. You're going to have to leave some things that are familiar to you. You're, you're going to have to leave some things that are comfortable. And as I just read to you, God is going to call you into a place that He's not going to give you every detail. If, you, if you're going on vacation, you don't just, of course you can't do this, but just suppose you could. You don't go to the airport and just, you know, with a suitcase of your clothes and walk through the airport and randomly pick a jetway to get on an airplane and say, you know, wherever this takes me, that's where I'm going. You purposely, intentionally determine where you are going and, and you plan out. And if you've never been there, you, you plan out as best you can. And it's amazing what you can do nowadays with, with the internet and researching destinations. In 1993, the year after my wife and I got married, my, my parents, my brother who's about nine years younger, and my wife and I, we took a trip out west, we flew out. Uh, to uh, flew into Las Vegas Airport, rented a motorhome, and we spent about three weeks traveling around throughout the West in some of the most beautiful scenery that God has ever made. Not that evolution caused, but that God made. And and my dad back then there was no internet like it is today. I don't even know if there was internet actually. And, and th- I think especially through AAA, but other ways, he, had to, he, got, he ordered all kinds of materials. And, and we had a three-ring binder of an itinerary of three weeks all the way down to departure times in the mornings of when we were leaving for the next location. And details about that, the places we were going. Nowadays, you can do something similar in a whole lot less time by just sitting down at your computer. We, we like to know something about, we like to know the details, we, we like to have some understanding, but I'm just telling you, when God calls you, first of all, when God saves you, but when God begins to unfold His purpose for you, because every one of us has a God-given purpose. When God begins to unfold that, like with Abraham, he said to Abraham, I've called you, now I need you to leave. I need you just to leave your surroundings. I need you to leave family. I need you to leave the place that you've been used to living, and I need you to go. Where am I going, God? Just go. So Abraham does that, and and, uh, 
he, he, he has a, a nephew that decides to go with him by the name of Lot. And so as they go on this journey following God's plan for Abraham, they, they, they begin to increase and, and their, their possessions begin to increase. And there became some strife and contention that was taking place between those that belonged to Abraham's household and those that belonged to Lot's. And so Abraham goes to Lot and he says, you know, we, we're going to have to separate. We're going to have to go different directions. And so in Genesis 13 and verse 8, the scripture says, Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes. I, I got to tell you, I don't understand why Abraham gave Lot the choice. God, Abraham is the one that God called, not Lot. Abraham is the one that God promised. But for whatever reasons, Abraham says to Lot, you pick where you want to go, and wherever you decide, I will take the opposite. I, I don't know if Abraham was testing Lot. I don't, I, I don't know what Abraham's reasoning, Lot. the Bible doesn't really tell us what Abraham's reasoning was behind letting Lot make the choice. But I will tell you what I believe is this. Abraham was confident that he could trust God that whatever decision Lot made was going to result in what was best for Abraham. Can I pause and tell somebody this morning, you don't have to worry about situations that may seem to be out of your control. You don't have to worry about things that may be going on in your life that you seem like you are not in control of. God is in control of all of it. And even the things that are out of your control, God can work those things together for your good. Paul says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. I don't know if Abraham knew that this is what Lot was going to do, but the Bible says Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after, the, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth then shall thy seed also be numbered arise walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it for I will give it unto thee then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre which is in Hebron and built there an altar unto the Lord I think it is at the very least implied from this passage that what what the, 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 the land that Abraham took as a result of Lot's decision was not as appealing to the eye as Lot's decision. The well-watered plains of Jordan. Lot's focus was on the well-watered plains of Jordan that were connected to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he did not take time to, to think through what might be the outcome, what might be the consequences if I pick this area with that city. I, I, I'd be surprised if Lot didn't have some kind of an understanding or knowledge about Sodom and Gomorrah. 
I'd be surprised if it was completely a place he had no knowledge of whatsoever. But the Bible says he saw what looked good. He saw what made sense to his natural eyes. And so again, the implication is that the land that Abraham got was not as appealing. It it did not look as good. My wife has helped me through the years, of course, now with the invention of HGTV and Magnolia Network, if you did not know it, the DIY Network has now become Magnolia Network. I know these things. Don't ask me why I know them, but I know them. I'll, I'll never forget the we we lived in a uh, we were living in a in a mobile home over uh, for Broadneck and Road and and uh, it was time to try to do something else and and uh, brother Bill Benner has been such a blessing to this church and on a personal level and we we uh, so he 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 took us to a friend of his had a townhouse over in Bay Hills area that. Uh, I don't even think it was on the market yet. He was going to sell it. It may have been on the market. But we went there, and, and the electricity was turned off. Nobody was living there. And, and, and we walked through there, especially went down to the downstairs, and there's no lights. You know, there was a, a, uh, a um, glass door leading out. So, I mean, there was some, but still, and it was just, I'm like, oh, man, I don't know about this. But thankfully, my wife had the ability, and I've, I've pretty much developed it, through experience, through much experience, <laughs> to, to learn how to see beyond what I see. And, and, and we, we bought it, and I think we lived there six or seven years, and by the time we left there, it looked completely different than we bought it, when we bought it. You, you, you got to learn when it comes to your your, your, the, the important things of life. You can't always judge by what you see in the moment. You, you can't always make your decisions based on what you can perceive with your natural senses because God has some things planned that you can't see in the morning, in, in the moment. God has some things in store for you that you, you can't see with natural eyes. And I believe somehow that when Abraham went towards Canaan and the land of promise, I, I, I believe that perhaps somehow he could envision. I, I know what I'm seeing and I, I know what Lot saw, but I also know there's something more. And, and Lot was looking for a city that man had built. Lot was looking to live a life that was, was a man-made life. But Abraham said, I, I don't want a life that man builds. I, I don't want any, do we have any self-made men or women here today? If there are any, God have mercy on you. Because if God has allowed you to think you're a self-made man or woman, there will be a day that will come that will prove that whatever it is you made, you can't contain it. You can't control it. Because every one of us are going to face things that are beyond our natural ability to deal with. But we can trust again that everything works in our lives for our good according to the Word of God. Abraham was looking for a city, a place whose maker was God. That word maker, according to Adam Clark, that word signifies an architect. One who plans, calculates, and constructs a building. The word signifies the governor of a people, one who forms them by institutions and laws, the framer of a political constitution. He, he was looking some for some place whose maker was God. Can I tell you today, there is a maker that if you will submit your life, if you will surrender your life to Him, He has the power and the ability to build something in your life much greater than you have the ability to build. And it's something that will last. The old song says, 
On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. One of the blessings, and I said blessings of the last two years, is we have learned more than ever before. You can't put your trust in natural things. You can't put your trust in a government. You can't put your trust in the medical profession. You can't put your trust in the economy. There is nothing in this world you can put your trust in. But is there anybody that has learned in the last two years that I can put my trust in Jesus and everything is going to be all right because he is greater than everything I may face in this life. Hallelujah. Jesus told a parable, Matthew 7 verse number 24 has to do with a foundation. He says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Now for you and I, the context of that is the Bible, the Word of God. Whoever hears, or, or if I could say it this way, because of the, what we have today, whoever reads these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone, somebody say everyone, everyone, not some, but everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great, great was the fall of it. I believe in the, in the context of what Jesus is telling in this parable, if you were to walk by those two houses once they were completed, you would see no difference. One would look just as good as the other. And I would venture to say that one of these houses was actually built quicker than the other one. Forgive me for a moment for using my imagination, but I kind of imagine the guy who built his house on the sand, sitting on his front porch, drinking sweet tea, watching the other guy still working. In fact, he may have been sitting on his porch with a finished house, drinking sweet tea, and the other guy hadn't even finished the foundation yet. And I imagine him sitting there with a bit of gloating. Look at you. Wasting all of your time on that foundation. You could have been like me and already been enjoying your house. You could have already been enjoying the finished product. And can I tell you, when everything in your world is good, when it's nice blue skies, when it's, when it's that high 60s, low 70s of a day like we have this time of year. Doesn't really matter which house you built. Here's the problem. Every life is going to go through storms. Every life is going to deal with some difficulties. There's going to be tragedies. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be sickness. There's going to be financial crisis. There will be storms that come in every life. And it is the storm that reveals the difference between the foundations. And it is the storm that shows the importance of taking the time to build on 
the right foundation. Maybe there's somebody sitting in this place and you've got a pretty good life going. Your finances are decent, life is fairly good, and everything is great, but you have not built on the foundation of the Word of God. I challenge you today not to take it for granted that the way your life is right now is the way that it's always going to be. You may need to tear down life and start over on the right foundation because there is a foundation that you can build on that no matter what storms may come, no matter what winds may blow in your life, that foundation is going to cause your life to be able to last. Isn't it amazing that when crisis hits, that's when so many people all of a sudden want to run to God. Because all of a sudden they realize, I've trusted in a foundation that its builder and maker is not God. I've, I've, I've built my life on a shaky, unsturdy foundation. Bible says, tells us about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. Moses, most of you I'm sure know the story, but he's adopted at a young age by Pharaoh's daughter. He was born as a slave. The Israelites were in bondage and he is miraculously taken into the house of Pharaoh and raised in Pharaoh's house. That means the life that Moses ended up getting in the beginning of his life was way, it's kind of like winning the lottery, you know. It was an unexpected life. He, he, he rather than living with slaves and all of the all of the hardships that they were facing, he's raised in Pharaoh's household. He's, he's experiencing the best that Egypt has to offer. He wears the nicest clothes. He eats the best of food. He lives in the nicest of palaces. He's educated by the smartest of people. According to the scripture, 40 years of his life basically was spent in those circumstances. 40 years watching as the people he was actually born to continued with difficulties and hardships. This is what the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, and again that was around 40 years old, he was come to a place of having to make a decision. How am I going to live the rest of my life? Am I going to continue living in Pharaoh's household and experiencing all of the wonderful things I'm experiencing? Or am I going to give all of that up? The Bible says when he was come to years, he chose. Rather than to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. The message, or excuse me, the Passion Translation says those verses this way. Faith, the Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of what we don't see. Faith enabled Moses to choose God's will. For although he was raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he refused to make that his identity. Choosing instead to suffer mistreatment with the people of God, Moses preferred faith's certainty above the momentary enjoyment of sin's pleasures. He found his true wealth in suffering abuse for being anointed more than anything the world could offer him. For his eyes looked with wonder not on the immediate but on the ultimate faith's great reward. Again, Abraham looked for a city whose foundation 
was God. And I believe in the context of this message, I could say that what Moses did was he looked at Egypt and he looked at the children of Israel. But rather than just looking at what he saw on the surface, he inspected the foundation. And he realized that what Egypt had and everything Egypt had to offer was on a foundation that man had built. But then he realized that Israel, in spite of the circumstances they were in in the moment, had a foundation that was made for some storms. And so rather than choosing what Egypt had to offer him in the moment that would have brought pleasure in the moment, he chose reproach and suffering in the moment knowing where it was going to lead to. Can I tell you that in the Old Testament, Egypt is a type of the world and the children of Israel are a type of the church. And so you can look at the world today and see all of the pleasure, see all of the fun that it has to offer and you can decide to go the direction of Egypt or you might look at the people of God and think you know what those are some those are some boring lifestyles those are some old fashioned out of date people that may be the way we look on the surface but we've got a foundation that we are standing on and there's going to be a day and time in which that foundation is revealed as being the most important part of your structure I can't tell you how many times that I teach or preach things and somewhere in the back of my mind as I'm saying those things as I'm teaching those things I'm thinking you know what the world thinks if the world was hearing you right now they would think you are absolutely ridiculous We teach our young people here, you're not supposed to have sex before marriage. And a good way to end up not having sex before marriage is not start touching somebody that's not your spouse before marriage. That is, come on, that's crazy. I mean, just, just go watch a few minutes of Disney and find out how out of date that kind of thinking is. Just go watch a few minutes of TV and find out how out of date what we believe is. But I'm really not worried about it. There's been a few times it got to me a little bit. But I once was young and now I'm older. And I realize there's a whole lot of things in this world that come and go. There's a lot of fads that come and go. There's a lot of ideas that come and go. But the Word of God remains the same. And it is the foundation that I have chosen chosen to build my life on and I'm here to tell you today it is a sure foundation surely I must be preaching that if you give your life to Jesus if you surrender your life to him that means you are looking at a wonderful life you are you are You are, but just like the rose, that rose bud is beautiful. There's some parts on that rose that can hurt you. I'm not here today preaching to you that life with Jesus, life on the foundation of the Word of God, is a pain-free, problem-free life. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Jesus said it this way, In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So I guess maybe you would think, well, what is the point of living a life on the foundation of the Word of God, surrendering your will to the Word of God if we all go through the same stuff anyway well I'll tell you one of the differences is those that don't know Jesus go through what they go through without any hope without any peace but I go through what I go through with peace and confidence like the psalmist said yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil because you are with me 
I'm not preaching to you today that a life built on the foundation of God and the Word of God is a pain-free, problem-free life. It's not because to the person that's saved, this life is the hell we will go through. This is it. If you're saved, this is your hell. But for those that aren't saved, this is their heaven. So don't sit around being people, being jealous of people that are in their heaven right now and you're in your hell. Because unless the mercy of God works in their lives, there's coming a day where you're going to be in your heaven and they're going to be in your hell. But the diff- They're going to be in their hell. But the difference is, this is temporal and that is eternal. Oh, Jesus. Job said it this way. You read the first chapter of the book of Job and you find out Job was a very wealthy man. Job was a very blessed man. The Bible says of Job, he was the most upright man of his day. And then all of a sudden, in one single day, his world falls apart. Everything crashes down around him. He loses all of his possessions. And the most tragic thing of the day was seven sons and three daughters all died in one single accident. We find as you read through, read on in the book of Job, the person who should have been the most supportive, the person who should have given him the most encouragement, says to him, why don't you just curse God and die? That's all his wife had to say. She didn't say, Job, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm going to stay with you going to be all right. She said, why don't you just curse God and die? You know she had an insurance policy. I ain't trying to keep living in this misery when I could cash out on you. Just give it up. I have no Bible for that. I just think that. But Job responds with a very challenging statement. He said in chapter 2 and verse 10, I believe it is, he said, will we receive good at the hand of God, but not evil, not bad? Listen to the way, listen to the way the message Bible says that verse. He told her, Husbands probably should never, it's amazing she didn't just kill him instead of letting him die. The Message Bible says it this way, you're talking like an empty-headed fool. (laughs) That's got to be one of the, I never really, that's got to be one of the miracles of the book of Job that he said that King James says, you talk like a foolish woman. I'm not going to reread that part. I'm just going to move on. Listen, listen. We take the good days from God. Why not also the bad days? We are more than willing and ready to take all the good days that God gives us. But the moment God lets us have some bad days, oh man, we want to know how dare you, God. I mean, it's okay if you want to pour on all the blessings you want, but how dare you? It's an old song that says, Sometimes the clouds hang low, and I'd like to see them go. I ask God the question, Why is there so much pain? course says, God is good to me. 
Oh, yes, He's good to me. More than this world could ever be, He's so good to me. Can you take all the good stuff, but then you're not willing to trust Him for the bad days? I I realize what you see of me, most of you, what you see of me is in this setting. I don't really have a choice. I don't, I don't believe in being a hypocrite, but I don't really have a choice. You, you have, most of you have the luxury of coming to church and having a bad day. I don't get that luxury. You come and sit and do nothing during worship, you got that prerogative. If I come and sit and do nothing, you're going to forget about everything they're doing, and all you're going to be doing is, what in the world is wrong with the pastor? He ain't doing nothing. I I get that that goes with the job. Really, that goes with all roles of ministry and leadership. But, man, I was was just telling someone the other day, I was rehashing (laughs) some of my my wife and I's story of marriage. Do you know how great it is for your ego to take your wife on a honeymoon And then have to come back home to your bedroom in the basement. That just really strokes your ego. (laughs) No, she wasn't pregnant. We weren't forced to get married. We We had to have no money. Then my parents were building a house and out of their generosity they built a, an apartment as a part of the house they were building and for three years never charged us a, a dime of rent we ate at their table most days finally we were ready to get a place and it's no longer there anymore over on Broadneck Road it's now a community with 800 thousand dollar plus houses but there was a trailer park that was there and we just happened to buy a 14 by 70 mobile home at the same time Clinton was going through a bunch of his scandals and the popular term you were hearing about all those people that were accused of scandalous relationships with Bill Clinton was they were trailer trash we drove out of the park one the trailer park one day, and the wooden sign for a nice neighborhood across the street, somebody had painted, spray painted, I guess it was for their girlfriend, and some really nasty words in including that she was just trailer trash. So, you know, I, 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 I didn't have everything I had that I have now. I haven't always had it. Don't, don't, don't think just because the way things look now. I, I, it's been a fun week at the right house. We prayed a couple of weeks ago. My wife's got a bulging disc in her neck and she's got a steroid shot and it basically didn't do a whole lot. She's supposed to be getting another one tomorrow, possibly, but many of you know she's had like a number of you, migraine issues for years. Last Monday, she had a terrible one, was up in Pennsylvania, went to urgent care trying to get help, finally kind of got it under control, but then throughout the week, neck-related stuff, pain got worse. She basically just spent all week on the couch or in the bed, one or the other. Friday morning, migraine started back up, and... and uh, couldn't quite get it knocked out. Yesterday, it kept getting worse. She started throwing up. and So she and I went on a nice date for about five hours to the ER while she laid there and they pumped medicine in through an IV. Can I take the good days? not also be willing I'm not trying this is not a pity party here I'm not she probably is watching probably going to be kind of mad at me for telling all of our stuff but I'm not preaching to you a hypothetical message this morning in 
what it's like to stand up here this morning and lead you telling you God can do miracles in this place with a wife that's been sitting for almost 24 hours with a mask over her eyes with a migraine that's probably the second worst she's ever had. God's doing miracles for you in this place, but I can't get one for my own wife. But you know what? I have a foundation. And I've learned, I've learned that if I'll just, if nothing else, as I said earlier in this service, if I'll just some days be still. There was, there was a day in which, somebody will come to the keyboard, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. There was a day in which Jesus had been saying some hard things to people. And it wasn't just a crowd, it was some people that were actually, they weren't the twelve disciples, but they had, they had been around Him enough, they had followed Him enough, they were considered disciples. He got to saying some hard things to them, and one by one, they started walking away. He, he knew what it was like for crowds, for multitudes to come and listen to him teach and then leave. He knew what that was like. But, you know, it's a whole different thing when the people you've been close to. The Bible says that disciples started to walk away. And when many of them had walked away, he then turns to Peter, or excuse me, to the disciples the twelve that were with him and he says to them will you go also are you going to have trouble with what I'm saying also or are you going to struggle with dealing with what I'm telling you and Peter speaks up and apparently he spoke for all of them he simply says this Lord where else can we go because you alone you alone have the words of eternal life you want to know what Peter was saying Peter was saying we built our lives on a foundation We understand that there's going to be some days that are not nice, sunny, comfortable days. We understand there's going to be some days where there's some earthquakes and there's some tornadoes and there's some hurricanes. But we're going to stand on a foundation that will get us through no matter what comes. I don't know how many get rich schemes have come and gone in my lifetime. Multi level marketing companies that pop up overnight, and somebody makes tons of money while others invest hopes and dreams and finances in a magical fix that usually doesn't pan out for the majority. wealthiest people in our world are not the people that were somewhere down the line on a multi-level marketing scheme. It's people who have worked and worked and worked and worked, worked and worked and worked, failed and worked again, disappointments and kept going. I'm afraid I'm afraid that for too many people, Christianity has sort of just become a get-rich-quick scheme. Now, I don't mean that in the sense of money, per se. But I mean it, it's, it's become this thing that it's the magical solution to all of your problems. It's the fix to all of the issues you're going through. And it is the fix to all of the issues you're going through only problem is he doesn't always fix it the way you want him to fix it, but he fixes it the way that is best. So what 
is your foundation built on today? I've said this numerous times throughout my preaching. Perhaps somebody here today, your thoughts is, you know, I'm just not sure about this God thing. I'm just not so sure about this eternity thing. Prove it to me. The bottom line is, when it's all said and done, there's an element of faith that has to be a part of it. But again, if you gamble on the fact that all of this is unnecessary, not real, not worth it, that figuratively doing what Moses did and when you could live your life your way, do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, why would you give all of that up to become a Christian? To give your will up to God and His Word. Why would you want to do that? Here's the deal. If you gamble on the fact it's not really real and you get to the end, what happens if you find out it was real. You see, I've decided if I'm going to gamble on whether or not this is real, I'm going to place my bet, forgive me for using that terminology, but I'm going to place my bet on the fact that it's real. Because if I get to the end and I find out that there really was nothing to all this God, church, Christianity stuff, what, what have I lost? What have I lost? I'm about to celebrate 30 years of marriage in May. I've got four adult kids that are couldn't ask for better kids. They're not perfect. But, excuse me, I've got five adult kids now. Sorry. I'm still working on this. We added a son. October when my second daughter got married. I, I got people in this room that all of you mean something to me. Some I've had a chance to interact with a little bit more and build a little closer. I can't have a personal relationship with all of you. I don't have enough time in a day, in a week. But, but got a family I've got a great natural family but my, my kids growing up and even actually still now as adults there, there's people that are part of this church that they call uncle or aunt that are not biological relatives but they view them as that just as much as they view natural relatives that way if I get to the end of all of this and find out could have had a few more minutes to sleep every Sunday what have I lost there's a foundation whose builder there's a city which hath a foundation whose builder and maker is God and all other ground sinking sand. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes if you would and I'm, I'm going to give an altar call this morning and I'm going to do it. Really it's it's an invitation to everyone. It's not to, a, to a, just a brand new person and it's not to a person that you're here all the time because anyone that's willing that this applies to. I, I want to invite somebody to get up out of your seat. And if you're a guest, I want you to understand what I'm about to ask. is It's not an invitation for you to come join this church. That's not what it is. If you want to become a part of this church, we'd love to have you. We would be thrilled for you to be. But, but whether you become a part of this church or not, that's not the point of what I'm about to say. If you're here today and... You, you haven't really built your life to this point on the foundation that I've preached about to you this morning. It's never too late to start. It's 
never too late to start. And others of you that you've been building your life on this foundation. There's some of you have been going through some storms. Some of you have been going through some very difficult things. And the enemy wants you to focus on all the storms and the difficulties when what you need to do is focus on, wait a minute, all this chaos and turmoil and tragedies going on, but I'm, I'm still standing because I'm standing on a firm foundation. So I want to give an invitation right now for, for those of you, maybe you haven't really made your mind up to build your life on the foundation that God builds, to, to come and start today doing that. But there's some others that I feel like you, you need a recommitment today. That, I, I, Like Peter said, we, we've got no place else to go. God, when this, when this Christianity thing doesn't quite go the way I'm hoping and dreaming, I, I've got no place else to go because this is the foundation that I'm building on because it's the only foundation that lasts. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, There's a lot of things we may try to build on, but there's only one thing worth building on. There's only one foundation worth building on. That's the foundation of you, the foundation of your word. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, I realize it may not be everyone, but somebody right now needs to make a step. I know you could do it where you're sitting, but there's just also something about getting up and making some steps as a demonstration. It's a demonstration to yourself. It's a demonstration to God statement by your actions to say, Lord, here's what I'm doing. Giving myself, I'm surrendering myself. I want to build on the foundation. I want to build on the foundation that's going to cause me no matter what storms come in my life, no, no matter what adversities I go through, I want to build on the foundation that's going to cause me to last. Lord, I pray for anybody today that is doing like Lot did and they're making choices in life based on what they see and based upon what is most appealing to their eyes, their senses, their tastes, their preferences. I, I pray that you would help them to look beyond those temporal surface things. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, if you don't need or feel to respond for yourself right now would you be sensitive to the spirit of the Lord to lead you to pray with or minister to somebody else in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus there's no there's no anchor there's no other anchor that can hold you through the storms that come and go in life and the anchor that is fixed to Jesus. Trust in you. Lord, I'm not just going to be willing to take the good days from you. I'm not going to be willing to just accept good from your hand and not accept what seems to be bad. I'm going to stand on the firm foundation. I'm going to stand on the firm foundation. My hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Never, never. He's never going to let you down. put my faith in Jesus. Never let you down. My anchor to Through the storms. Through the wind. Through the rain. He won't let you down. It's a foundation you can stand on. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Alamando robo se yeki alarabo hosha. I hope in the foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Come on, some of you need to make up your mind today. You gotta make up your mind all over again today. I'm standing on this foundation. I'm standing on this foundation. I'm not going to let anything cause me to build on another foundation. I'm not going to let anything that I'm going through cause me to give up on this foundation. I'm going to stand. I'm 
going to stand. I'm going to stand strong on the foundation that God built. In the name of Jesus. 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 No other foundation, Lord. No other foundation can last but the foundation that you build. In the name of Jesus, never let us down, Lord. Never let us down. There may be some moments it feels that way. There may be some days it feels that way. But we can trust the foundation that we've built on. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We trust in you. We trust in you today. You're the foundation we're building on. You're the foundation we're building on. No other foundation can last. No other foundation will last. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let you down. We'll never let you down. By the time the story is over with, you'll find out he didn't let you down. Even if there were moments it felt like he did. Even if there were some days it felt like he did. When it's all said and done, he won't let you down. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, there are those that are still praying, but if you need to go or want to go, you're welcome to. Thank you for being here today. Oh, my anchor to the ground. I hope. All of the ground is sinking sand, but you. All of the ground is unstable, but you, God. You're the firm foundation I'm building on. You're the firm foundation my life is standing on. I'm not trusting in anything else. I'm not going to put my trust in anything else. I'm not going to build my life on anything else but you, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, my hope is in you, Lord, my confidence is in you, Lord, my trust is in you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 